My dear friends in Christ, I mentioned that the third spiritual conference today would be on St. Joseph as the main theme. The Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph. And St. Joseph is a wonderful saint, but a saint that in many ways has been hidden from Catholic devotion down through the centuries. In fact, there was not a feast day in honor of St. Joseph, at least in the Universal Church, until I believe the 16th century. And so we might ask, why is that? Why was St. Joseph little thought of and invoked, prayed to, in the early centuries? Well, one of the reasons is that he is not mentioned very often in the Gospels. And I believe that St. Joseph, out of his great humility, desired that he be hidden and unnoticed. Also, it was more important in those early centuries that the doctrines of Jesus Christ, his divinity, the incarnation, the one person in two natures, that these be defined and taught by the church and other basic doctrines, the Trinity and so forth, that they be understood by the faithful. And so the point is that St. Joseph was in many ways forgotten or hidden from the devotional lives of Catholics in the earlier centuries. It is like we mentioned in the first conference where devotion to the Sacred Heart was not known or practiced widely in the earlier centuries. So also devotion to St. Joseph. Now one saint who lived in the 16th century was greatly devoted to St. Joseph was St. Teresa of Avila. St. Teresa of Avila was a Carmelite who reformed the Carmelite order, brought it back to a greater rigor, and she said many wonderful things about St. Joseph, but let me just give you one quote. Would that I could persuade all men to be devoted to this glorious saint, for I know by long experience what blessings he can obtain for us from God. I have never known anyone who was truly devoted to him and honored him by particular services who did not advance greatly in virtue. For he helps in a special way those souls who commend themselves to him. It is now very many years since I began asking him for something on his feast, and I have always received it. If the petition was in any way amiss, he rectified it for my greater good. I ask for the love of God, that he who does not believe me will make the trial for himself. Then he will find out by experience the great good that results from commending oneself to this glorious patriarch and in being devoted to him. Here's another quote from the same St. Teresa of Avila. Those persons who give themselves to prayer should in a special manner always have great devotion to St. Joseph, for I know not how anyone can think of the Queen of Angels during the time that she suffered so much with the infant Jesus without giving thanks to St. Joseph for the assistance he rendered to them then. He who cannot find anyone to teach him how to pray, let him take this glorious saint for his guide, and he will not lose his way. And of course, many other saints and spiritual writers have written wonderful things about St. Joseph. I'll just give you one more, and this is St. Thomas Aquinas. Some saints are privileged to extend to us their patronage with particular efficacy in certain needs, but not in others. But our holy patron, St. Joseph, has the power to assist us in all cases, in every necessity, in every undertaking. Truly, St. Joseph is the greatest saint in heaven after our Blessed Mother. Now, some have asked, well, what about the words of our Lord 
where he said, a greater man has not been born of woman than John the Baptist. So there's that debate. Is John the Baptist greater than St. Joseph? But it is easily understood when one compares that quote, which I think is in St. Matthew, with the same quote of our Lord in St. Luke, I believe, or St. Mark, where our Lord said, a greater prophet has not been born among women than John the Baptist. So our Lord was talking about prophets. St. Joseph was not a prophet. We refer to him as a patriarch. But you can tell the sanctity of St. Joseph by his closeness to our Lord. In fact, I borrowed a book recently, which I'm very much enjoying on St. Joseph. It is entitled, The Man Nearest to Christ. Imagine that St. Joseph lived with Jesus and Mary for 30 years. He observed the Christ child grow. He had the great happiness of taking the infant Jesus into his arms and holding him, caressing him, pressing him to his heart, and again watching the Christ child grow and advance through the years. St. Joseph had a deep, deep love for Jesus and Mary, a solicitude for their welfare, he was their guardian, their protector, the bread earner, and how much he loved them. He also is considered the great patron of the interior life because every day he witnessed their virtues and he meditated upon it and prayed. We could say he was united to God continuously, a life of continuous prayer. But St. Joseph was also a very hidden saint because he was deeply humble. It says in sacred scripture that St. Joseph was a just man. That means he had all the virtues. Now, this book, among others, goes into many aspects and draws from all the different theologians what they say about St. Joseph. And the common opinion was that St. Joseph had made a vow of chastity from an early age but he was united to our Blessed Mother in marriage by the will of God and miraculously. And also that St. Joseph was probably not the ancient man that some pictures in Catholic art portray him as. A man with a gray beard, looks to be like a grandfather. According to this book, he was probably about 30 years of age when he was married to our Blessed Mother. Some theologians, again, believe that St. Saint Joseph was, by a special grace of God, completely preserved from all temptation of the flesh. At any rate, he was the most chaste spouse of our Blessed Mother. But his greatest glory was in being the foster father of Jesus Christ himself of the Son of God. And to Jesus, St. Joseph was the representative of God the Father in his life on earth. How much Jesus must have loved and honored St. Joseph, because in honoring St. Joseph, he was honoring his Heavenly Father. And that is what we teach children about the fourth commandment, that they have the duty to honor and love and obey their parents, to be respectful. Because in doing so, they are giving that honor to God, whose authority the parents wield over their children. And what is interesting is when our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph found our Lord in the temple, after he had been lost for three days, what did she say to him? Thy father and I have been seeking thee, sorrowing. And she didn't say, thy foster father and I have been seeking thee. She just said, thy father and I. And as St. Luke says in his gospel, when our Lord began his public life, they said, uh, St. Luke says, Jesus, who was presumed to be the son of St. Joseph. In other words, people were not aware, the, the populace were not aware that St. Joseph was his foster father. So what an honor to be called the father of of Jesus and to be truly in a legal sense the father of Jesus Christ this privilege 
and his wonderful virtues raise St. Joseph above all the other saints after our Blessed Mother herself. And it is indeed due time that the Church, the mystical body of Christ on earth, give the honor and glory due to St. Joseph. So his, his patronage, uh, an understanding of his role in God's plan, of his holiness, that a knowledge of this has been growing among the faithful, especially over the last 200 years. It was, I believe, Pope Pius IX in the latter 1800s that declared St. Joseph the patron of the Universal Church. Pope Pius XI designated him as the patron in the battle against communism. St. Joseph is honored, of course, as the model of workers, the model of artisans, a patron of family life, a guardian of virgins. Religious sisters have a special devotion to St. Joseph as the guardian of their chaste lives. But we all should honor him. We all can find in St. Joseph aspects of his life that are a source of inspiration and a reason to pray to him for his intercession. Many theologians believe also that just as our Blessed Mother is in heaven body and soul, the Assumption of Our Lady, that Saint Joseph also was taken into heaven body and soul. That, of course, is just a private uh, belief, but certainly we can believe and ought to believe that Saint Joseph is far above the other saints in holiness because of his closeness to our Lord his diligent labor for the support of Jesus and Mary throughout those 30 years. And of course, the common belief is that St. Joseph died shortly before our Lord began his public life, and he died in the arms of Jesus and Mary. So he is a patron saint of a happy death. And those who honor St. Joseph will obtain for him from him the grace of a happy death. And that is one of his greatest prerogatives, being the patron of a happy death. So these are just a few of the many reasons why we should honor St. Joseph, the many causes that he interests himself in for the faithful who honor him. And maybe because he was unknown or little known for so many centuries, we should vie with one another in giving St. Joseph the honor that he so richly deserves. Men especially look to St. Joseph as a patron to help them fulfill their role as husbands and as fathers. Now, of course, St. Joseph had a son, a foster son, who was perfect, who was divine. And you fathers, have boys and girls, sons and daughters, who need constant correction, advice, direction, leadership. And you can invoke St. Joseph to help you in fulfilling that all-important role. Now, in the last conference, we were speaking about our Blessed Mother, and I mentioned to some degree the sad fact that our society has so completely distorted God's plan. And women who buy into the modern feminist ideas find themselves unhappy because going contrary to God's plan cannot bring happiness. But the same could be said about St. Joseph, that he is a model for men to embrace their vocation as heads of their families, to lead their family to God, to lead the prayers for the family, to be the example. Now, a man's piety is different from that of a woman. Women have a greater, what shall I say, feeling oftentimes in their piety. It comes more easily to them. Whereas for a man, it maybe is not that easy. 
but a Catholic man who is conscious of his duties and of his responsibility not only to lead the family but to give the example will be certain that he is regular in his prayer life and reception of the sacraments, in attendance at Holy Mass, and again, giving a good example. Now, we all have our Achilles heel. We have maybe different things that we have to overcome. For men, probably our biggest failing or problem for many men is pride because a man is made to be a leader and we have to constantly keep that sense of pride in check just as women have to counteract vanity or gossip or other faults jealousy which are more common in women men have to counter counteract the temptation of pride temptations of lust temptations of anger to look to St. Joseph as a model of consistency. That, those words, St. Joseph was a just man, convey the idea of all virtue. And we all have, again, our own particular failings, and that is why examination of conscience is so important. To examine ourselves to see, where am I deficient? Where do I fail the most? And then we make the resolution to improve in that area, to counteract that particular fault, to strive to grow in holiness. St. Joseph can be a model for all of us in that regard because he lived such an interior life. There are no words in Scripture recorded of St. Joseph. None at all. Doesn't mean he didn't speak, but he certainly didn't give in to idle conversation. He spoke what was necessary. And speaking of speaking reminds me of something I read. It was a sermon, I think, of either St. Bernard or St. Bonaventure about Our Lady, that there are seven words of Our Lady recorded in Scripture. And by words, I don't mean individual words, but I mean seven times that Our Lady spoke. It mentions in Scripture seven times. And what is interesting about that is every time Our Lady spoke, she spoke a few words. The only time she spoke at length was when she was speaking to God and of God. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. The Magnificat is more lengthy. And yet all the other times Our Lady spoke at the marriage of Cana to our son, they have no wine. To the servants, do whatever he tells you. At the Annunciation, how shall this be done since I know not man? Be it done to me according to thy word. At the finding in the temple, son, why hast thou done so to us, etc. Brief, to the point, and Our Lady here is a wonderful example, as is St. Joseph, of avoiding loquaciousness, avoiding Wasting words. Mentioned in the last conference, our Lord's statement that we shall have to render an account for every idle word. But St. Joseph was busy doing his daily duty. He was a carpenter by trade. And we must believe that our Lord worked in the carpenter shop. Isn't that what the Jews said of him? Is not this the carpenter's son? How then has he come by this knowledge? They were so surprised when our Lord began his public life and began preaching, they thought, where did he get this? Isn't he a carpenter's son? And notice that our Lord did not disdain to be called a carpenter's son. He didn't say, wait a minute, he's just my foster father. My, my heavenly father is my true father, etc. Our Lord, we might say, delighted in being referred to as the carpenter's son how much our Lord loved his foster father. What a debt our Lord must feel towards St. Joseph for all that he did for our Lord on earth. And that is why St. Joseph is so powerful. Go to St. Joseph in your prayer life. You know, in the Old Testament, 
There was a Joseph, one of the twelve sons of Jacob, and he was Jacob's favorite. Jacob had made for him a multicolored cloak that aroused the envy of his brothers. And it got to such a point they disliked Joseph so much that they sold him into slavery to Egypt. And by God's providence, Saint Joseph, or not Saint, but Joseph of the Old Testament rose in prominence in Egypt to become the what we would call the prime minister, the second man after Pharaoh. And this Joseph in the Old Testament stored up grain during the seven years of plenty. And when it came to the seven years of famine, people would go to Pharaoh and he would say to them, go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. Now, those words in Latin would be ite ad Joseph, go to Joseph. And Holy Mother Church takes those words and applies them to Saint Joseph. Go to Joseph and do whatever he shall tell you. Go to Saint Joseph in all your needs. So as we honor our Blessed Mother, as we call ourselves children and indeed slaves of our Blessed Mother, let us also be great devotees of Saint Joseph. Let us have a great confidence in him. Turn to him in our needs, especially for family needs, domestic worries and cares. St. Joseph, who was the head of the Holy Family, must be most powerful. Can you imagine Jesus and Mary not wanting to grant his requests? When St. Joseph goes with our petitions to the thrones of Jesus and Mary, they straightway grant his request. That is why he is so, such a powerful saint, and we all should have great confidence in him. But getting back to what I was saying in the last lecture and a little bit here about the role of men, women, children, a family is happiest where each member in the family is fulfilling his God-given role. The man, the husband, the father, is, in imitation of St. Joseph, hardworking. He is loving. He's a strong leader. He doesn't shrink from fulfilling his duties out of a feeling of unworthiness. We're all unworthy. But he shoulders that responsibility and he leads his family to God. He gives an example and he leads the family in prayer. The mother is the heart of the home. It is the mother that has the most influence over her children. She is with them all the time. She has the most lasting influence. There's a great little book entitled The Mother, Mothers of Priests, and it goes into like St. John Bosco, St. John Riviani, and other priests, and what they said about their mothers. Oftentimes the mothers are unnoticed or forgotten in the lives of these great saints. How did St. John Marie Vianney become such a holy priest? It started with his mother training him, teaching him. Who would ever look upon that role as unimportant? And that's why the modern feminist movement is so wrong. They haven't gotten it so wrong. What could be more important than the role of a mother in forming and molding and raising her children? We all have a different role. You have different roles in your family. Embrace your role. Pray to Jesus and Mary and Joseph to help you fulfill that role so that your family will also become a holy family. And it will if we do our best, human and imperfect as we are, to fulfill our God-given role in the home. So St. Joseph must not be forgotten. This is the month of St. Joseph. We will celebrate his main feast in a couple of weeks, but he should have a prominent part in our spiritual life. To pray to St. Joseph in our needs, to pray with confidence, and especially to imitate his extraordinary dedication to duty, his humility. St. Joseph, who felt himself, he knew he was so inferior compared to our Blessed Mother and, of course, our Lord. But that didn't cause him to shirk his duties. His deep spiritual life, his tremendous love for Jesus and Mary, 
and his deep love of God, his justice, the just man who practiced all the virtues. May we all imitate Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph. And by doing so, they will help us to be with them one day in heaven.